Hey guys, welcome back to episode three this time. Is it free? Yeah, it is free. Uh, episode three of the weekly wellness podcast with myself, Paul uh, and Tom. Um, if you haven't listened to any of the previous episodes as yet, um, you can head over to my website, peacewithpaul.com. You got an introductory video, an episode there. Last week, um, we dove, drove, no, we didn't. We went deeper into uh, Tom's conversation, if I can speak. So there's an interview there. Uh, great interview with Tom talking. Um, and this week, episode three, um, it's all about me, which if any of you who know me, you know I love that. Uh, when it's all about me, I'm in, I'm in my element. So yeah, welcome to episode three of the weekly wellness podcast with Paul and Tom. Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you now, mate, because I know that um, you're going to be leading this and asking me some questions. So over to you, mate. Thanks, Paul. I mean, it's it's great to be back. I really enjoyed last week's um, conversation that we had. Um, and it gave me an opportunity, to, I think, to talk about things that I haven't really talked about, kind of, I say, publicly, but mm. you know, with a lot of my friends. And, you know, there's perhaps some people who listen to it that may, you know, find out some things about me that they didn't know before so I, I was I was really grateful for that opportunity to speak about it um and you know I've done a lot of reflecting after it to be honest as well on some of those things and thinking yeah, about brilliant. how far I've come with my own journey and, and yeah yeah so oh, just, yeah, like I said grateful for the opportunity but I suppose now the tables are turned so yeah um yeah where to start really I suppose you know when when we started last week we started chron chronologically so for you, Paul, when when do you think was the first time you realised you'd experienced any anxiety? Yeah, well, that's interesting because it's. Um, I mean, when I, I think when I first realised, I was a lot older than when it actually started. So when I first realised, probably wasn't. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't until late teens early 20s um and i'm sure we're going to go back to my childhood and we, we talk all about that sort of thing anyway but um yeah it was probably from 21 when i had the severe panic attack which um we will talk about that in quite a bit of detail um but yeah i think um prior to that that's obviously i'm, I'm 46 now so so this might be broken down in decades. <laughs> so I'm that old. <clears throat> um, prior to that, I didn't, you know, and if I kind of look, and I was thinking about this the other day, but if I do look at my childhood, I can't ever really remember anything before I was seven, seven years old. Um, and the only reason why I really remember anything from seven upwards was um and again you and i've had a, a bit of this conversation i'm a mad obsessed football fan i even know i've got footballs on my desk and like, it's ridiculous i'm a massive tottenham fan which is embarrassing to admit at the moment um but at seven years old when i started to port in tottenham at five um at seven my name was drawn out of a hat to be a mascot for tottenham um and it was an incredible day i spent the day up there with my family in the changing rooms and, and all sorts of things walked out in front of, you know, 35,000 people. And it was incredible. It was an incredible day. Um, so and that happened when I was seven. So I can only remember stuff from there, really, going upwards. Um, what I do remember, though, going back to those days, because although, kind of answering your question, although I only really kind of, I think, late teens early 20s when I kind of I, I think I understood what anxiety was um but even then after that particular event so I say I was seven I remember going back to school that obviously that after that weekend on the Monday with the program that was all signed and everything else <clears throat> excuse me and I was talking to one of my best mates at the time I used to play football with and um and he which I didn't know uh he was at the match and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. He was like, I couldn't believe it. When I opened the program and see you there, it was unbelievable. Now, him and I were obviously talking about it, both huge football fans. But then even then, sort of jealousy started kicking in. 
and from other people it was like oh what a load of work. like how did you do that you know mum and dad's little rich kid bought you something else and, and all of this sort of stuff um so although I didn't really know what anxiety or kind of bullying or mental health or anything was then, you know, like I say, that's going back, you know, 38 years or whatever. I think that's when it really started, really started. Um, so, yeah, it was it was interesting. But then it was nothing that was really like particularly bad or particularly overwhelming, because at that age, it's just like, well, it's just kids being kids. You know, it's like I've just experienced something which, let's be honest, most people aren't ever going to experience in their life. So it's that that jealousy side of things um, and nothing else was really sort of done about it. Then secondary school come, you know, so like that first kind of 10 years of my life. That was the biggest thing that really kind of happened to me. Um, and then obviously then started secondary school at 12. That's when things really started to change really started to change um so my sister is what about three and a half years older than me something like that so every time i started a new school she was in the last year um so i i always had her friends kind of protecting me and looking after me as the little brother every school we started now again because of that that sort of started creating jealousy and all sorts of things at school because obviously sister having a lot of female friends some of them were beautiful um or fit as we used to say when we were younger probably still say now I have no idea not that I'm that old but obviously like you know I'd be walking around school and like my sister's mates would be coming up to me like hi Paul we were right you know how's it going and always sort of being there looking after me um and obviously some of her male friends as well. But the female friends, you know, my mates who I'd grown up with, the area that I've grown up with in, in Downley, uh, in High Wycombe, and obviously played football with a lot of uh, lads since I was like five, six, seven, were suddenly like, how do you know her? How do you know her? How, why are you speaking to her? How is she speaking to you? And, all, and I'm like, well, oh, they're like my sister's friends. I'm like, why? What different? Oh, she's fan. I fancy her. She's fit. I'd love to speak to her. I'm like, we're going to speak to her then, you know. And obviously, sort of saying that to a twelve-year-old lad, I'm like, I can't, I can't speak to her. It's her. She's like the hottest girl in the school. I can't speak to her, you know. And then we walk down the corridor, and then someone else would come around and go, "Hi, Paul. You're right." And I'm like, "Yeah, hi." And I think obviously, being me anyway, I would always be a bit like, "Yeah, I'm all right." You know what I mean? Like, trying to impress my mates. Um, but then it did. It then just got to a point where, you know, I was like 12, 13, entering the first year or so of, of secondary school is tough enough anyway. Um, but then I suddenly had that. Um, and bullying really become a big part of my life then. Um, sort of, you know, I, I got involved with the wrong people, like, you know, a lot of us do. Um, but where I grew up in... Uh, in the village in in Downley, where I like, say so where I was, you got one side which was like the big houses, the rich wealthy families, and then the other side was a uh, big council state working class um, families. And like my parent, like my parents are still in the same same house now, been in over fifty years. So my parents rode where they lived, beautiful cul de sac. They was like right in between both areas. Now, a lot of like the rich and wealthy was like the ones who I was playing football with, but never really accepted me as a friend because um, I was like, you know, uh, who are you sort of thing, you know. Um, so I used to hang around a lot with the other side, like the what I'd class as working class kids, working class families. My dad was a factory worker. He was an upholsterer. My mum was part time um, cashier uh, and secretary uh, in one of the local banks. Um, but you know, my sister and I never went without, not because my family were were rich, and I say again, just typical working class family, but they worked hard. Um, so my sister and I always had lovely family uh, holidays, but I'd always, even to this day, at, like I say at 46, I've always had the, the, the drumming into me is that you only get from life what you put in. So at the age of 12, I already had a job. <clears throat> I had a paper round. And when I started the paper round, it was 75 papers. And I was earning, I don't know, 30 quid a week, something like that, 25, 30 quid a week. And it was great.
but then there was three other rounds near me and um, and I started speaking to them. And interestingly, I think this is where kind of like my entrepreneurial side really sort of kicked in. So there was one girl there. She had um, a paper round, which was virtual on my doorstep, and it was 75 or 80 papers. And I remember speaking to her one time and she was like, yeah, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do it anymore. I was like, OK, well, I'll, I'll buy your round off of you then. She was like, what do you mean you buy it off of me? I was like, well, I'll, I'll buy your paper round. She was like, I don't think you can do that. She's like, just speak to Angela and Kevin and I'm sure they'll give it you. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> so I did. And like the people who used to run the paper round, Kevin, he used to be one of my football coaches when I was a kid. So I said to him, I was like, Kevin, I was like, I think her name was Catherine, I think. I was like, Catherine isn't doing the paper round anymore. Can I have it and add it onto mine? He was like, yeah, of course you can. I was like, mint. So then suddenly like, I went from like 35 papers to like over 100 or something. Well, I'd done this with four other rounds or three other rounds, whatever it was. Suddenly I had the biggest paper round in the area, <clears throat> which was making me about 80 to 90 pound a week as like a 12, 13 year old. I was then also started working down at Wickham Wanderers, local football club, as a ball boy, and I was setting programs, and I was getting ten pound a game then. So as a teenager, I was suddenly earning nearly a hundred pound a week as a thirteen-year-old. Um, so again, then people then started looking at me and so-called friends. Oh, look at him! Look, mum and dad's little rich kid, always getting given money and this and that. And it wasn't at all. It was like I'm working. I finished school on a Friday at half two. And I can remember walking back home and outside my house on a Friday was just literally the driveway was full of papers, leaflets, flyers and everything else. And kind of like the production started as soon as I got in and the like, production line. But that was because I'd been driven by my parents. So like, And I think you mentioned it the other, the other week, last week. If I want anything in life, work for it. It's not a given, work for it. And I had though, I had that, but yet, Although I was earning like good money, again, like the rich side of the, the village still didn't want to know. So I was involved with this lot. But then very early doors in, because I had money, started smoking weed. I was buying weed um, and doing drugs because I had the money. And like a lot of them didn't. And I, just, I wanted to fit in. So I'd done whatever I could do to fit in. And that meant buying weed. You know, it's like, great, look, suddenly I'm popular. I can afford a bag of weed now and I'll go and smoke it and share it with my friends. Or, you know, let's go and buy a packet of B&H cigarettes and, you know, Benson and Hedge fags and sit around the park and buy fags. And But it was purely because I wanted to fit in because the so-called friends I grew up with didn't want to know me. Um, so all of this, you know, and I'm not certainly not proud of a lot of things I'd done but at 12 years old I, I got arrested for the first time in my life it was ridiculous through theft and criminal damage um which was horrendous um at the time I thought I was cool you know look at me like you know I remember going to school and we were like oh my god Paul like you're a legend and I'm like yeah try and say that to my parents you know what I mean they they don't look at it like that so kind of like my teenage years were all like I say trying to fit in but because of what I was doing, nothing bad, but I was working hard and earning money. There was more and more jealousy coming about what I was doing. Um, and the bullying got it got worse. Some days after school, I run home from school in fear of my life, crying my eyes out, just hoping and praying to God that I would get home safely. Um, because it was horrendous. Um one Friday, well, no, one Thursday night, let's say we must have been about 16 or something, and I, we used to go to a nightclub, the uh, youth club, and um, and there was a girl there who I used to go to school with, she was in my class, we were really good friends, and her boyfriend at the time was probably, um, well, not probably, he wasn't the nicest of lads, but that particular evening, I walked her home, we finished youth club, whatever it was, nine o'clock, and um and I walked her home again I've been brought up with ethics I wouldn't let a girl even now you know if I'm dating or whatever I'd still do the same so I you know her and I walked home made sure she got home safely nothing happened at all but she got home safely I went home that was the Thursday night on the Friday I uh, say I was um went to do my paper round so I would have been, I probably would have been younger. I probably would have been 14, 15, sorry, when we done this, because I didn't have a paper round when I left school. So I would have been about 13, 14. So walked her home. Friday then, I went to do my paper round. 
and I got into a certain area and then suddenly like a few people who I knew come up to me and uh, and there was like look just to let you know Kevin knows what happened last night and he's coming for you and I was like why what happened last night and they were like what I was like what happened last night I was like I was at youth club last night and they was like yeah but and I'm not going to mention any names because I don't really want in case anyone listens I don't want to drag up old stuff they was like yeah but you walked home with um with his girlfriend I went oh god I was like we virtually live near each other so I walked past I dropped her off and I went home and they were like, well, that's not what he thinks. So anyway, he then, I was halfway through my paper round and suddenly all I heard was, oh, you little, and I was like, uh-oh. And he he was crazy. He come after me, he had a couple of knives and he had a pellet gun. And he kind of, all I heard then was that, like, right, with it, and I was like, fucking hell. And he come after me and he was like, oh, I'm gonna fucking kill you. And he's got these two massive knives in his hand come running after me. And that's how I'm like, as I said, would have been about 14, 15. Obviously, I shit myself. So I've legged it because I knew if I went one way, I'm going to end up at my like, best mate's house. And I did. I ran straight to his house. And again, that was kind of like a next level thing then of being chased with knives and obviously having a pellet gun firing at me. And then it did. It, did. it went to another level um a, a, a week or so afterwards again we was at youth club and this particular person we was all outside and this this lad turned up again and again he had massive knives and uh, and he come down and people are like paul 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 you need to go in you need to go in i'm like why what's going on and suddenly i just went uh, like past my head and i was like crikey i was like what was that and they were like paul get in like he's there he's coming after you again and again he had these massive knives coming after me trying to get at me um and it obviously we had to you know call police and and things like that um so yeah i would have been about 14 15 so a lot of this all happened while again i say well i was at school trying to do gcse's i had girlfriends and everything else um and a lot of it all come just down to jealousy i wasn't doing anything that i shouldn't have done apart from working hard to earn money trying to have friends i was always popular with football and sport and girls and everything else just trying to be me but i never really knew the the subconscious and the mental damage that all of this was doing to me you know yes it was bullying at the, a huge degree it was horrendous um but then soon luckily i when i saw when i left school when i went to college when i was 16 like my life completely changed because i was in a, I, I was at college at a different area i'd met new friends and i could be me i could be like this cheeky chappy and and it was brilliant. And, you know, one of my best mates is from college, two of my best mates are still from college. And I could just be me. Um, yes, I was still smoking a lot of weed and doing a lot of drugs because you know, that was kind of my life. That's what I was doing. But that was just me. But I was away from it all during the day. And at some point, obviously, I had to go home and I'd be home. You know, I'd get back to my mum and dad's, you know, um, I don't know, half six, something like that, get home for dinner. Then I'd go out in the evenings. Um, you know, as a teenager, 16, 17 year old, and it'd start again, you know, the bullying, the fighting, um, you know, literally kind of like gangs. And it got to a point that when I was like 17, 18, I was like, I need to put away from this lot. You know, this is this isn't going to end well. And I can remember one night my parents went away, uh, went out for the evening and uh, myself and a couple of my mates stayed in at my parents and uh, I, again I would have been like 17 maybe at this point and I remember it wasn't late it was winter time so it was dark outside like there was loads of shouting and stuff outside um in the road and I was like what's going on there so I opened up the curtains and I say my mum and dad's road is a private cul-de-sac so it's lovely and there was about 20 people out there like all of the people who I'd spent the last seven years or so like knocking around with get outside get outside I was like, what? And I opened the window. I was like, what's going on? Fucking get outside. We want you. We're going to kill you. And I was like, whoa. I was like, what's going on? And because I'd started pulling away from this particular gang, a group of people, they hated it. Um, because like I say I had the money. I was earning money. I was buying weed and doing all that. They absolutely hated it. And they're like, we're going to burn your house down. We know you're inside. We're going to finish you off. And I was like, whoa, Christ. And I can remember like phoning one of the lads' uh, mums and I phoned her up and I was like, look, 
I went, your son and all of this lot are outside my house. They're threatening to burn the house down. They're threatening to kill me. I said, this has just gone to another level now. I was like, you either come up and sort them out or I'm phoning the police now. She was up within minutes and she was like, look, for God, leave him alone. She went, he's the sensible one out of you lot. You know, it's like just because he's decided to walk away from you guys, he doesn't want to know, you know, leave him alone. It's like you lot can learn from him, Um, which in a way was a good thing. But at the same time, again, sort of poured, you know, fuel on the fire. Um, So they did that night. They walked away. Um, But it it carried on. It carried on. Um, Obviously, again, I then started working. Um, I was at college and I had jobs in retail. Um, and then I started working at what at the time was Concept Man when, again, I was like 18. I had a great career with them. But some nights I would leave and I'd come out of the shop in the shopping center and there'd be two or three of them outside the shop waiting for me. And it got to a point where I had to, like, before I'd leave, I'd have to contact security just to be like, can you meet me outside the shop so I can walk back home, you know, with you to get the bus? And, and they would to make sure I was safe. Um, so, like... A lot of my growing up years were spent like always being on edge, always looking over my shoulder. Are they there? Am I going to get attacked? Am I going to get beaten up? Am I going to get a knife in me? Am I going to get shot and all of this? Um, And then, like I said, you know, growing up then up until like 21, again, I had a great career in sales, again, earning good money, still smoking a lot of weed and doing things that, you know, kids do. Um... And then at 21, I can remember uh, it's my my day off and I went around the pub for only for a couple of pints because I was heading back. I moved out with my parents when I was about 19 and um, I was like, so I was 21. It was the summertime when I was 21, went around the pub to meet my mate for a couple of pints and um, literally two because I was going to my parents and my girlfriend at the time come and pick me up. It's about half five, got in her car. And uh, yeah, as always, like, hey, baby, I give her a kiss and, and whatnot. And we was going down and it literally I mean, I could have walked to my parents in like seven to ten minutes. So the car journey was like, you know, two to three minutes, not long. Got in her car, got onto the road, which is I think it's called Hivercroft Road or Tinker's Wood, whatever it is. Got in there. I'd only been in it a minute or so. And as we're going down, like literally suddenly all I could see was kids on their bike in the road in front of me. And I was like, I was telling I was like, stop, stop, stop the car. What are you doing? What are you doing? She just kept going, I was like, what are you doing? And like, all I could see was her getting closer to these kids. And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? She was like, what's the matter with you? Shut up. And she just went straight through. And I was like, what? It's like, what's going on? And, and then we got to my parents' house. And I can remember, like, my sister opened up the front window to the house. And, and as I was getting out of the car, she was like, come on. She went, hurry up. You're late. Dinner's on the table. That was the last thing I remember. Next thing, I've woken up. I'm on the bathroom floor at my parents' house. Para- uh, paramedics either side of me, like mum and dad um, in front of me in the bathroom. And I was like, what the hell? What's going on? And it's kind of a little bit funny now. But the first thing as I come around, the first thing I looked at one of the paramedics and the first thing I said, I was like, where's my kebab? And he was like, no, mate, no. And I was like, what? I was like, what's happened? I was like, what's, what's going on? So obviously then they sat me up, right, and uh, had some water and that. And I was a bit like, Jesus, you know, like, what? where am I? What's happening? And um, so the, the, the outcome of that was that I had had such a severe panic attack that it actually caused a lack of oxygen to my brain. I collapsed and I died for around about 30 to 40 seconds. And fortunately, obviously, I collapsed. It happened at my parents' house. So they were able to obviously phone the ambulance. Um, I can only, because I say, I can't remember anything from my sister shouting at me. So I can only imagine, obviously, I've gone straight upstairs into the toilet. um, And I'm guessing I was obviously up there for a while. And then they come up worrying. Um, So, yeah, I collapsed. Uh, so I had severe panic attack, collapsed, and I died for around about 30 to 40 seconds. Um, so I was very, very lucky. One, I was very lucky to survive. Um, I was also very lucky to survive without brain damage. Um, but it it kind of started my journey of anxiety then. 
because then that so was 21. I then had, because of what happened, I had to have a few appointments at the doctor's to kind of really understand what was going on. I had my very first uh, MRI scan, brain scan, to make sure I was okay. Um, and I, had, I ended up having three of those. And it was then when my doctor was like, she went, I think you need counseling. And I was like, what? She's like, you need counseling. I was like, no, I don't. I was like, I'm all right. She's like, no. She went, you, you need counseling. <clears throat> so I was. So uh, I went to counseling and um, obviously my very first session, I didn't know what to expect. You know, all I was told is it's someone you're going to be speaking to about, you know, your problems and stuff you're going through. I'm like, I ain't got any problems. Great. I'm smoking a load of weed. I'm living my life. I'm, you know, I've got a good job and I'm doing all right. Thanks. You know what I mean? Um, and um, and when I started counselling, uh, this is where I might start getting a little bit emotional on this, to be honest with you guys. Um, so we obviously we started talking about things. I started talking about, you know, growing up and, and my childhood and, and stuff. And she said to me, she was like, she went, talk to me about the last six months of your life. And I was 21 at the time. And I went, oh. I said, yeah, it's been an interesting six months or so, really. She's like, why? I said, well, my 21st birthday, I was at a funeral of the dad of my best friend. She went, on your 21st birthday? I went, yeah. I said, he died a week or 10 days prior. I said, his funeral was nine o'clock on my 21st birthday. And she was like, crikey. She's like, sorry about that. I said, no, I said, that's cool. Um, I said, four weeks afterwards, I said, one of my best mates and closest friends who I'd grown up with at school was killed in his car um, on his lunch break. I uh, said he had gone bowling and on his way back to school and some maniac just took him off the road and, and killed him. Um, bless his soul. Um, I said, and it is at his funeral, when we had his funeral, and uh, which was tough because we was, so I would have been 21, he was only 18. Uh, I said, one of my other closest friends, dearest friends, Adam, bless him, who hadn't been seen out in public, he come to the funeral because we was all friends. And he had just lost his hair because he'd just been diagnosed with a very rare cancer of the spine, again, at 18. Um, <clears throat> I said I lost him as well a few months after Will's uh, death. Um, I said, I say, Adam had a very rare cancer of the spine at 18. And uh, he was at home uh, and it was like sort of lunchtime-ish. And and he was tired and he said to his mum, like, you know, bless, I'm I'm knackered. I'm gonna go to sleep. And he's like, Well, remember the nurse is coming in a couple of hours. So, you know, I'll wake you up in a bit. And he was like, Yeah, no worries, mum, love you, speak to you in a bit. Um, well, he went to sleep that afternoon, and that was the end of his life at 18. So just after Will had died, we then suddenly had um suddenly had had Adam's funeral, uh, which was shit, said goodbye to him. So suddenly in the space of about three months of being turning 21, not only had I say I'd, I'd, I'd had a few free funerals, um, I never I was never really a drinker, but drinks suddenly come into my life and obviously more drugs. Um, and then, so we had Adam's funeral um, and then, it seems ridiculous, about six weeks after, like, so I was working in River Island and there was again a group of us then um one of our other friends close friends was then killed in another car accident and again he was only 19 two years younger than me um and it was just uh, literally i mean i'm, I'm sort of shaking it 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 completely just completely destroyed me suddenly within let's like, say four or five months of turning 21 i'd lost three very close friends and my best mate's dad um and it was like, holy shit, you know, it was like, bang, bang, have some of that constantly. So when I was telling, obviously, the counsellor about that, and she said, she went, what have you done to grieve any of these? And I was like, I haven't really, I haven't really had time. And then obviously I was talking to her about the bullying and the threats and everything that I'd had, because again, at this point, um, the girlfriend that I had, um, lovely girl, we're still best friends, well, very close friends now, bless her her ex-boyfriend and this all sounds like and it's like people say to me Paul you need to make a movie about your life but like this guy come after me one night I'd come out of my girlfriend's house and I knew that I was getting followed back home 
And I was like, what? And obviously then we had phones. I was one of the first people to have a mobile phone in our group. I was like, what's going on? We pulled up to these lights and this guy, again, I'm not going to mention any names, but this guy like looked at me, he's like, pull your window down. So I dropped my window down and he looked at me. He was like, you need to get out of Wickham. I wasn't going to kill you. And I'm like, who the hell are you? So I was like, whatever. So uh, lights went green, boom, foot went down. I had like uh, an XR2i Fiesta then. And he then chased and he was chasing and he was fun. We were suddenly chasing and racing around Wickham. And I was like, this isn't good. So instantly I was like, I'm going to head down to the police station. So I got down towards the police station, went to go in and he cut in front of me, dropped his window down. And all I had was this, this gun out of this window. He was like, I'm telling you now, get out of Wickham, otherwise I will kill you. He said, I will kill you. And I'm looking at this guy and he's got this gun. Like, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, 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 all right, yeah, cool, 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 no worries. And like, he went and I went home. And I remember like getting on the phone to my girlfriend at the time. And I was like, do you know a particular person who drives this particular car? And she was like, oh my God. She's like, yeah, it's my ex. And I was like, oh, great. She was like, why? I said, well, so he's just chased me around Wickham and uh, just put a gun to me and told me that I need to get out of Wickham, otherwise he's going to kill me. And she was like, oh, poor shit, I'm so sorry. She's like, and this guy had just come out of prison. He's supposed to have got done for murder, but nobody, you know, would, no witnesses would come to, and he got done for manslaughter. Um, and he was out and knew that I was with his then ex-girlfriend. So obviously I'm telling my counsellor all of this, and she was like, my God, she was like, you're 21. She went, and you've been through all of this already. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, kind of the norm, isn't it? I was like, this is... She was like, no, Paul. She went, this isn't normal. And I was like, oh, okay. So then that then triggered why. When going back through everything, my childhood, answering questions, again, of bullying and, you know, attacks and fights and everything else. She was like, she went, you've been living with anxiety since you were 12 years old. And I was like, living with what? She's like, anxiety. I was like, I'm sorry. I was like, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you're on about. I was like, what's anxiety? um and it, she was said she was like general anxiety disorder she went that's what you've got she went you are literally living a life of a bag of nerves checking over your shoulder are you going to get shot are you going to get stabbed are you going to get beaten up are you going to get attacked is somebody else going to die am i going to lose another friend and i was like oh okay i was like well i just it's my life that's what i it's what i've done so that's why, and I know, you know, that's taken me probably about half an hour or longer to answer one question. Um, <laughs> but that's how anxiety come into my life through dealing with all of that at such a young age um, and being told then. So I then, I like say, you know, I ended up having counseling for the first time for about four and a half years. But then I really then started looking into my life, looking at my daily habits, looking at the friends who I was with, my social circle what I was doing, um, you know, the friends who I had lost, there was me smoking weed, doing numerous other drugs, which, you know, a lot of people know about, not that I'm proud of. Um, I suddenly, I was drinking loads. Um, you know, I was kind of living this sort of rock and roll lifestyle as such, you know what I mean? Just being a typical kid, partying, having fun. I was abusing the hell out of my body. And like Adam, bless who died, like I say, of cancer at 18, he was so fit. Uh, he'd just been, unfortunately, he, he died before he got his A-level results and he smashed his A-level results. He'd also, he loved cricket. He'd also just been accepted into one of the, the cricket uh, schools or academies. But he passed away before he knew that. And then, like I say, Will, uh, who was killed in a car accident. So I was kind of looking at all of this. And I was like, damn, there's me abusing my body here. Um, and like these people are, are dying around me for no, no reason whatsoever, just accidents and other things. So I really started looking at my life then. And uh, and then, you know, I was then, I think, 25 or I think, yeah, it must have been 24, something like that. And uh, and it, it kind of happened again. Like my best mate at the time, um, I worked with him again bless his soul um i never work my birthday never have done and uh, at the time i was working for orange mobile phones now ee for those who aren't old enough to know um and i was a manager in there and i had my birthday off 
uh, which is the 5th of March uh, for any listeners. I know it's gone, but for future reference. And um, on the, I think it was the, yeah, it would have been the 6th of March. I walked past, I popped past into the shop because I left my mate then to, to be looking after in charge of the shop for the two days that I was off. And uh, so I popped in and me and him were like that. Like we were just a nightmare for all sorts of things, but in good ways. Um, you know, girls, all sorts of things. It was great, great few years together. Um, but I looked at the sales records and I'd seen that he had made one of the biggest mistakes he could have made. And he sold back then pay, pay as you go phones. He sold, I think it was like 20 pay as you go phones to one person. Well, company policy was you could only sell 10, but he wanted to smash his targets. And obviously, because I wasn't there, he's like, oh, well, you know, he'll never know. Dickhead, it's registered, so obviously I will. So anyway, I went back into work on the 7th of March and uh, opened up the emails. <clears throat> and as I opened up, my uh, my regional manager phoned me up. Hi, Paul, I know you're back in today. I hope you've had a great birthday. Uh, I'm going to be in at lunchtime to come and see you. And I was like, oh, what do I own that pleasure? You know, again, cheeky chappy as I was. She's like, well, you, I'm guessing you've seen my email and you've seen what uh, what Andy done uh, yesterday. And I went, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to speak to him. Don't worry, leave it with me. I said, I know he's broken company policy. She went, well, yeah, he's definitely done that, Paul. She went, but I'm coming down at lunchtime, she went, because I'm afraid um, head office have seen it and they want instant dismissal. Like, you've got to sack him today. And I went, I'm not, I'm not sacking him. I was like, it's his mum's birthday today, 7th of March. I said, it's his mum's birthday. Um, I said, I'm out with him tonight. I, he's going to see his mum. And then I'm out of him tonight for my birthday. I went, you also know he's like one of my best friends. I said, I'm not doing that. She's like, you've got no choice. She went, I'll be down at lunchtime. And I'm afraid like you've got to dismiss him. And that's it. So I was like, shit. So I, uh, I was like, look, Andy, I explained the situation. I was like, look, Andy, I'm sorry, mate. This is what's happening. I said the regional manager's coming in at lunchtime and it's instant, instant dismissal. And he was like, oh, you're joking. I was like, no, I'm sorry. So she come down and it was, you know, instant dismissal. I took his keys and, and everything off of him. And, um, and he went and I was like, look, mate. I said, obviously, it's your mum's birthday tonight. Go and see your mum. I said, and I'll meet you. I'll come and pick you up at, at half seven. Um, and we'd go out and he was like yeah yeah, yeah cool he's like, I'm really sorry I was like look likewise mate I'm sorry about this but we'll sort something out so anyway I finished work uh went home got changed had a little bit bite to eat and I'd say him and I were meeting up gonna go for a few beers and stuff and uh and on the way like I said you know I had, had a mobile phone then I was, again I was you know 24 something like that and on the on the route to him the way I was going suddenly we got to a point and you could see blue flashing lights up above. And it was mayhem. Traffic, it was ridiculous. And it was like about 12 minutes past seven. But my phone had been going off the hook from seven o'clock. And I couldn't answer it because I was in the car and, you know, obviously trying to be as sensible as I could at the time. But one of the missed calls was constant. It was from Mel. And I was like, what's going on? And then she texted me and she was like, Paul, please come around to my house. She went, summit's happened. Come around to my house. So we were stationary. <clears throat> And by this time, I got a little bit closer and I was about five or six cars away from this accident. And I was like, shit, I need a ringer. And so I ran, I was like, look, Mel, I was like, there's been an accident. I'm up near uh, Hazelmere um, Church. Um, I said, I'm going to pick Andy up. I can't come around. She was like, no, you need to come around. You need to come and see him. I was like, I can't. I'm running late. I said, I'm supposed to be at Andy's in 15 minutes. I'm running late. She's like, it's Andy. She went, you need to come and see me. And I was like, what? She was like, you need to come and see me. I was like, what is Andy at yours? She's like, no, you just need to come to mine. And I was like, all right, okay, I'll turn around. I'll come to yours. So I did, went back to hers. She's come running out of the house, crying her eyes out, give me a massive, I was like, whoa. I was like, what's going on? I went, are you okay? <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> and she was like, no. She's like, it's been an accident. I was like, I know. I was like, I've just been trying to get through it. She was like, it's Andy. And I'm like, what's Andy? I said, I've got to go and meet him. I said, no, what's going? And she went, the accident. She went, it, it's Andy in the accident. And I'm like, what? She's like, it's Andy. And I just think, I was like, I don't know what you're on about, man. I said, what do you mean? She was like, it's a motorbike accident. She went, and um, she was like, it's it's Andy. She went, he's he's just, he's been killed. He's just been killed on his bike. 
And I was like, what? I was like, no, he hasn't. I was like, I was with him. Like, I said, I know I've just sacked him. I was like, I was with him like five hours ago. I said, I'm just going to meet him. I was like, what? I said, why would you say this? She was like, it is. She was like, I'm so, so sorry. And because of where it happened, a lot of my mates were in and around the area. So then when I started checking my phone for all these missed calls and messages, it was like everyone was telling me. And I was like, Paul, and he's just been in a motorbike accident and and we think he's dead. We think he's he's been killed. And it was like, what? So then it, again, it all started again. I was about 24, still having counselling. And suddenly I'd lost, literally he was, he was like my right hand man. Um, and it was horrific. And I obviously, you know, that was, it was, like I said, about 10 past 12 past seven that evening when it happened you know five hours prior i was with him and, and i sacked him he was on his way to see his mum for his birthday he was going out for my birthday um and i held i held a lot of guilt a lot of guilt for that for for a long long time and um and then i then got introduced to cbt cognitive behavioral therapy and um, one of the biggest things was because of Andy and the guilt, um, because it was like, in my mind, if I hadn't have sacked him, he wouldn't have been killed. And what he'd done was that when he finished, he went to the pub, had a couple of pints. Um, and then when he was on his way to his mum, he was behind a car. This car went to turn left and Andy then come to overtake it, as bikes do. So the car turned left, Andy overtook to keep going, but then there was a car coming this way that didn't see Andy. He went in the side window, um, his bike went underneath, the force of Andy spun the car around, threw him out the back window and broke his neck instantly on impact and slung him about 200 yards down the road. Um, <clears throat> so he was killed on impact. So when I was having CBT, a word that she kept saying, she brought this up, she was like, ru uh, rumination. I was like, I don't know what you mean. I have no idea what you mean. And that was one of the biggest things that come into my life. So <clears throat> what she was saying was that, you know, everything that had happened in my life, I always tried to figure out an answer. I was trying to find and understand a solution on why things happened, I'm a, which emphasizes why I kind of do what I do. I'm a thinker, I'm a strategist. I always think things try and find the solutions i'm a problem solver so i then spent like you know from a teenager trying to figure out a lot of it subconsciously why all of this was going on and it was just building up and building up and building up um so when i was speaking to my counselor she was like this is why you're living with anxiety and i was like what she's like this is why you've got it when you have to understand what you're doing to yourself she's like mentally you're killing yourself and I was like, wow, okay. So then, again, like I said, you know, that I then really started looking at my life, but it wasn't until I was 28, I moved up to Northumberland when I was 28. And um, and that was a real eye opener for me because I was suddenly, I'd always, you know, sort of been about when I was younger, I managed pubs and, and moved around different places. And my mates used to, you know, used to sort of call me the traveling hippie because I would, you know, I went off to Nurka when I was younger and all sorts of things. I was always one of those sort of people. When I got up to Northumberland, it was different because I was still in the UK. I moved up there because I met a, a Geordie lass. But I was 298 miles from door to door. But the difference in areas, the poverty was unbelievable. Um, and it was then when I really started reflecting on my life. And at 28, when I look back, everything that I'd been through, it all come down to one thing that I'd spent my lifetime growing up trying to fit in and trying to be accepted. And when I kind of realized that, I was like, why can't I accept who I am? What's wrong with me? You know, it's like, you know, I'm a lovely person. I'm a great guy. I'm a laugh. I've got a great personality. I've always been liked. I've always been loved. I've got an incredible family. But for whatever reason, those things were never good enough or they weren't accepted by the people that I wanted them to be accepted by. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting 28 years of my life, which was traumatic, hugely traumatic, scary a lot of the time. Um, but I just got on with it. You know, I just kind of looked, I was like, well, this is life. 
just you just get on with it so yeah so uh, yeah that sort of takes us up to when i was 28 um and now i'm 46 and i've been through a lot more trauma <laughs> well i mean firstly thank you for sharing that you know so the, 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 you know the traumas that you've experienced you know i'm sure everyone's been through traumas but to different degrees and, and trauma is is different to different people i mean you know you went through some horrible bullying and then obviously you know bereavements and uh, especially of friends and peers is, is something that can be quite difficult to comprehend at the time and to to cope with um but yet for you from what you just said the the anxiety was sort of much more deep rooted within yourself than it was perhaps these external traumas that were happening mm. maybe there's you know there's a, a sort of a coalescence between traumas and you know not having that steady ground on which to walk upon to kind of figure these things out you know yeah. in, in perhaps an easier situation or you know but you know like similar to, to what i sort of touched on last week it was that you know struggling to to fit in that that sort of identity crisis that perhaps you you were going through yeah um I want to just touch on on uh, a couple of the things that you talked about in terms of, for example, the drug use. Do you, looking back, were you what, what would you put that down to so much? I mean, obviously, you said at the first point it was a way of trying to fit in with people. Was it? Do you feel like it was that for the whole time? It was, you know, when I do this, I can be this person, or did it become a coping mechanism for? Or dealing with certain things yeah it uh initially it was this teenage boy just doing what boys do you know i started i, I started smoking cigarettes when i was 12 started smoking weed when i was i think you know sort of 14 uh come 15 16 like weed was i uh, just an everyday part of my life and um and friends used to sort of take the mickey out of me because not like, it banter wise but i used to smoke embassy number one which again, you know, for a lot of people probably have no idea what they are, but they were great fags at the time. But I used to smoke 40 fags a day. So, but I used to have a packet of 20 uh, cigarettes. And I used to, it got to a point where I used to carry ready-made joints and I'd have another box with 20 ready-made joints in. Every single night before I went to bed, I'd sit there and I'd make a joint. I'd roll up and I'd fill that box. Now, at 16, when I used to go to college and I'd be waiting for the train, at half six in the morning, I'd be having a joint. Come eight o'clock, by the time I got to college, got the train, sorry, I'd get to college or the train station about half seven. I'd walk to college from the train station to college. I'd have another joint. So by nine o'clock when I'm starting college, I'm already, I'm like, I'm done. I'm away with the fairies anyway um so then come 10 half 10 when we'd have a, the first break go and have another joint lunchtime it wasn't joints we'd be putting on bongs in cars and sat around the corner like i was just like from from 16 until mid 20s there wasn't a day in my life where i wasn't stoned every single day i was stoned and and I will be honest, and I'm not saying to anybody to, who's listening to this that it's the right thing to do, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. <clears throat> Why? At the time, I just looked and thought I was high. This is great. I'm loving the life that I'm in. <clears throat> when I reflected on it after having counseling and looked at it, a lot of it was to numb the pain and to take me away from reality. Now, I was speaking to somebody only a few months ago who's very into star signs and all of this sort of stuff. And I'm I'm a Pisces. And and she said she went, ah, oh, Pisces. She went, um, the people who like escaping, like getting away from reality and like whatever. And it's all. And I was just like, wow, I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. So I think at the time, as much as I loved it, 
you know, me and the boys would be smoking, pulling on bongs, doing all sorts of things. And um, and sorry, parents, I know you know a lot of this, but if you listen to this, I do apologise. Um, <laughs> but um, it was great fun. It was boys being boys. But it was definitely my mechanism of my escaping the reality of the bullying, the threats, the crap, the shit that I was going through. And it become an addiction. Mm. And throughout when having counselling, it come out then that I've got an addictive personality. Yeah, and you, you said earlier that through counselling, you know, that, that sort of helped you to identify that you, you'd been living life on edge since you were, you know, a young kid, basically. Okay, yeah. And, you know, that's, I think, a lot of the reason why people end up, you know, taking drugs and drinking is, is to just sort of, soften the sharpness of that edge from which they're living on you know yeah absolutely at what point did you stop and what was the the cause for that the day i found out i was going to be a dad so i can remember again i was in sales working for renault and every single night i would go in the pub after work and me and my sales manager become re- my first ever proper sales manager in, in the motor trade become really good friends now we lived very close to each other um he was older than me married family um but every night we'd go to the pub so we would again boys being boys he's always older than me you know quite a lot of the time we'd be racing to get to the pub and whoever got there first you know it was like you, um, you know whoever's last would buy the first pint as such well, we'd go in there, we'd get in there half seven, between half seven and half eight most nights. Um, he was always the sensible one. He would obviously have a couple of pints and he'd have to go back to his family. However, I had nothing to get back to. So I'd sit there and get hammered. And then I would text him going, Mark, can you uh, can you meet me at the pub in the morning? Like, I need to get in my car. And he'd be like, oh, for God's sake. Um, or it'd be like, uh, I got hammered. I left the car at, at the pub. I'm going to be late. Or can you pick me up and we get the car later? There's no way I can drive in. And so that become a regular occurrence. And, you know, drink only really come into my life into my early 20s because I was always smoking. And then uh, so when I come out of the motor trade, I then got into the pubs. I was working pubs when I was young, when I was a teenager anyway, well, a teenager. Yeah, it was obviously teenage, 16, 17, 18, whatever. But then I got the opportunity to manage my first pub, um, which is then when I found out that, um, you know, that I was going to be a dad. And um, <clears throat> and that particular, when I found out I was going to be a dad, that particular night, I met my old sales manager in the pub to speak to him. And I was still smoking. We got halfway through a fag. And I was like, I'm done. And he was like, what? And I put it, he was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I put this fag out, screw it out of that box with about eight left screwed him up threw him in the bit he went what are you doing i was like i'm done i was like i'm done with everything and he was like what i went that's me finished smoking i was like, i'm never going to smoke again i said i'm not going to touch weed again i was like, i'm not doing any more drugs we used to go raving and we used to take speed and stuff i was like i'm done he was like what what he was like no you won't no you won't and uh yeah well, i mean my my daughter will be 20 this year in july she was born 2003, July 2003. So nine months prior to that, you know, 2022, that was it. <clears throat> and I've never touched a cigarette since. I've never touched any drugs, weed, speed. Obviously, again, sorry, mum and dad, if you listen to this, but Coke and, you know, there wasn't much I didn't try at that, that younger age. Uh, I haven't touched anything since. And it was like, you know, I'm going to be a dad. And it sort my shit out um so yeah that was that was why i stopped it all it was um it was like you need to grow up you need to sort yourself out you're either gonna get to a point which i think i was very close to either killing myself getting to a point where someone else is potentially going to kill me because of the people that i was with um or again just have such another severe panic attack that i probably won't come out of the next one um and it was a lifestyle choice that I needed needed to do. I needed to to sort my life out. And again, you know, I remember having counseling in one of the sessions and she spoke to me about my my habits, my daily habits. And I was like, hmm. 
I said, that's easy. I went, I just I get up and I go to work. And she was like, yeah, but like, you know, talk to me about like your morning routine and stuff. And I went, well, I just did. I went, I get up and I go to work. She was like, no, she was like before all of that. I went, what? I went, I get up and I go to work. I went, what are you on about? And she was like, well, okay. She went, let me ask you another question then. She went, what do you have for breakfast? I went, I don't know. I said, it depends. Like, I said, I'm probably on the way. I said, I'll probably stop at a burger van and I'll get a sausage and bacon burger baguette or something like that. And she was like, oh. She's like, and what will we have, have for drink? She was like, how much water do you drink? I went, water? I went, no. I said, I'll have, I'll have a coffee. She's like, oh, okay. She's like, and then what will you have for lunch? I went, oh, well, that all depends. Um, I said, subject to how busy I am. I said, I might go to Mackey D's or I said, I might get like, you know, sausage and burger uh, baguette or something. She went, you've had a sausage and burger baguette thing in the morning. I went, well, what is there a law that I can't have two in a day? You know what I mean? She was like, my gosh, she was like, okay. She went, so when, what, what are you going to have for dinner then? I went, I don't know, probably about 10 pints. She's like, no, seriously. I went, yeah, no, I'm, I'm being serious. Like 10 pints, probably a kebab on the way home or something. And she was like, wow. She was like, do you not like life? And I went, yeah. I said, it's great. I went, I'm living a great life. She went, Paul, she went, you're killing yourself. And I was like, mm, not really. She was like, no, you are. So again, it was all little triggers. And then as people know, like I say, I moved up to the Northumberland when I was 25. I started my business when I was 26. And, um, and I was working my backside off initially. Obviously, I started as a consulting, coaching and training company. And I can remember the girl I moved up to be with. Um, we was out in Matalan, I think, one Saturday shopping. And uh, I was like, trying to start a bit. It was manic. And I remember being in there and I went to pick up this T-shirt. And as I picked this T-shirt, I was like, oh, Jesus. I was like, that hurt. <laughs> and like, like, Deb's bless her if she listens. Oh, yeah um like she looked and she went you're right I went oh god yeah yeah yeah. I went that really hurt I went I don't know what what happened there she went you've just picked up a t-shirt I went yeah I know I went but I said that really hurt and like she looked she went you look a bit white she went you're right you need to sit down I went no no I went I'm all right and then suddenly like I started feeling all faint again and she grabbed me and she was like come on come on she went let's go back to the car and we went and sat in the car she's like we're going home and I went yeah 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 and on the way home, I was in the car and I was like, oh. Debs was like, I don't, I don't feel great. And she's like, what? I went, I really don't feel great. She's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. And I was like, no, don't be stupid. I'm one of the, I don't take tablets and all that. I'm taking you to the hospital. <clears throat> so we got to the hospital and we walked in. I went, you're all right. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, I'm not feeling great. And it automatically, I was like, I was holding my, like my chest. And I was like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not feeling great. And I went, take a seat and we'll be with you. Well, we were sat there for about 45 minutes. And I said, I went, come on, Dad. I said, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm going to miss bloody football. I was like, I just need to go home. Tottenham were playing Man City. I was like, I just need to go out. So I'm not missing this. And um, we got home and I did miss like most of the game. I caught like the last two minutes, uh, 20 minutes. Tottenham beat Man City. I think like 3-2 or some of that day. It was insane. So and that night we just went home, chilled out. She cooked dinner. And I went to bed tennis to watch match of the day um and i was laying on bed and um watching the, the tottenham and man city game and i can remember so we went three to up deb's was in the living room and i was like get in i was like well done and that was followed by she like she'd come running in the room and i'm like laying on the bed like this she went well, what's wrong with you i went i don't know i was like get an ambulance call a fucking ambulance so what they called an ambulance and obviously they come they rushed me in so i was 29 at the time rushed me in with expected heart attack and i went in there obviously like wired up to the to the bells sort of woke up like what on earth is going on here and um luckily i didn't have a heart attack it was another panic attack um but it was borderline to the point when they checked me and again, obviously, they checked my heartbeat and everything else. They were like, seriously, young man, you need to stop abusing your body. They went, you've just had another severe, because obviously it's on my records about my health. So you've just had another severe panic attack. 
um they said but you are borderline you could have had a heart attack there was like with your habits your health and everything else there's like you know you've gone from being this fit footballer sports person you're just abusing your body you're working on uh, working all these hours i was like i don't work all these hours i was like well that's not what your girlfriend was saying i was doing 78 70 odd hours a week and it was just abuse after abuse and again it was all down to hiding the traumas of everything that had happened i was just burying my head in everything um so that was the other wake-up call i was like i need to sort myself out here you know it's like i was 29 i was like i need to sort my shit out um so uh yeah i then started learning more about anxiety i was then given the secret the book the secret about personal development by Rhonda Byrne, um which you know i don't read for people who know that i'm dyslexic i don't read but one of my mates come around one day and um <clears throat> he um actually prior to i've missed a massive part so i started a business and then uh, we was then coming into the recession of 2008 and that hit me hard and i ended up having to close the business down that i had uh, which then also sort of come in between part of the relationship along with other things uh, so we split up she kept the house i then sort of become homeless for about six months i was bed hopping i was doing all sorts so uh, it was horrendous for about six months um i then started the business again um I wrote this ebook, digital ebook. It's the first one I ever wrote. Done a, I'm not going to go into details. It's been very well documented. Done a joint venture, but at the time, like I said, I was pretty much homeless. I was, I had two pound eighty seven in my bank when we done this, done this joint venture, and we sold 127, 128 copies of this digital book, made over six grand in profit, and that kind of kickstarted the business. What I've got now, again, like the coaching, training business. And one day, my mate, after that, my mate come around and um, and he walked into to where I was living. By now, I'd been given this tiny, tiny little studio flat. I was on benefits for the first time in my life, £52 a week housing benefit. Um, and at the time, I was earning, I, well, I wasn't earning, it was benefits. I was getting £350 a month. Um, and my mate come around. And as he walked in and he looked down and I sat, I don't know where it's probably in my other bedroom, but the secret at the time was a red cover. So it stood out a mile away. And because I only had half a dozen books as I don't read, my mate Nasba, he looked at me and went, oh my God, you've got the secret. And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I have. And he was like, I can't believe that. He was like, what do you think about it? And I went, what do you want about? And he was like, the secret. He went, what do you think about it? I went, oh, I went, I thought you was taking a piss, like kind of like out with me, like because of what I'd done. And he was like, no, dickhead. He was like, the book. I went, I don't know what you're on about. He went, that red book. I went, oh, I said, I've, I've had, I said, my old boss gave me that. I said, um, and he went, do you like it? I went, oh, I don't know. I've never read it. So I don't really know what it is. I said, what are you on about the secret then? He went, that's what it's called. And I went, oh, okay. He's like, I've got the DVD. He's like, do you want to watch it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. I don't really, again, don't really know what you're on about. So he went, got the DVD, come back. We watched that blew my mind and i was like oh my god i was like this is exactly what i needed and obviously for those if you haven't watched the secret or read the secret where the hell have you been um <clears throat> it was my kind of my first ever real experience with personal development law of attraction physics all of this and it blew me away i was like this is what i need so suddenly then i'd, I'd been introduced to personal development and that was the start of me changing my life, completely changed my life. Habits, daily habits, affirmation, everything that I teach now uh, is all come from like from that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I did. I just completely changed my lifestyle. I looked back at everything. And obviously with law of attraction and things like that, you know, everything that you put out into life happens. You know, and I was obviously focusing on <clears throat> the things that I was growing up focusing on was, yes, the money, but it was what the money I was earning was bringing me. And I was looking at it going, well, the money that I'm bringing, you know, it's it's bringing me joy and pleasure. Was it? Well, it was bringing drugs into my life. Yes, that created joy and pleasure, but I was breaking the law, you know, um, and I was mixing with the wrong people. 
Um, so all of this, so suddenly I had an understanding of law of attraction. Um, as I said, you know, what you put out to the universe, you get back. So that was the start of my journey then. And um, obviously, you know, I then I was, you know, become a certified life coach. And it was like, okay, I get this. I get this. Now I can use my life experience of the anxiety, the depression, the stress, the worry, the overwhelm, the panic attacks. I now know what I've been doing wrong and how I can overcome them. Um, so then I say I went on my journey of all these new habits and everything else. Um, and it did start changing my life. And now my six daily habits, which are rituals, I've now been doing, let's say, nearly 20 years. Um, and that is part of obviously my coaching program and, and what I do. Um, but yeah, everything I'd done was based on just not I hated reality. And I'm not going to lie. Even sometimes now I look at this country, I look at the UK and I'm all, I was at my mum and dad yesterday just you know bad mouth in this country i'm so grateful for everything that i've got in my life but this country drives me mad um and it was like you know i want to go and, as people know i want to go and i want most of my life or half of my life to be spent living in india i love it out there i'm so connected spiritually mentally everything out there um but then is that me escaping again so so at everything that i've been through in my life is now part of my coaching program um on what i do because it's you know it's trained it's changed my life it's transformed my life um do i still have and live with things with anxiety yes i'd be lying if i said i didn't the difference now is that i do things on a daily basis that help it so you know some days are worse than others um if I'm stressed, if I have too much going on, because again, especially like with, within the business world, uh, I love it. I love creating new things. Um, one of my biggest problems in my life has been learning to say no, because I love a challenge. And I'm always like, yeah, come on, let's do that. And then I'm suddenly then like, oh, why did I say yes to that? But because I'm a man of my word, I will do it. So then when I'm getting overwhelmed, I then say, you know, that's when obviously my, for those who don't know anything about my six daily habits and rituals and everything else, it's just, they're simple. They're nothing new. Been around for hundreds of years, but most people don't do them. So all it is, is like routine, simplicity, exercise, journal, uh, affirmations and meditate. They're like the six things. And each one can be done 10 minutes a day. Like bring it into your daily habits, 60 minutes a day first thing in the morning and i change your life i guarantee it um so yeah so everything that i've done over the years has been i think to numb the pain of everything that i've gone through and just to continue living in the world of paul wakefield rather than living in the world of reality i'm not a fan yeah. of reality and i think it's it, it's really interesting and powerful that what I think you and I have in common in, in that kind of way is that we've brought our life experience and the things that we've done personally to overcome our difficulties mm. and our mental health problems into our coaching. That's how our approach is based. You know, yeah. we help people with similar problems, but we've come at it. We come at it from our own, yeah. our own approach, from our own experiences. And I think that's, that's really powerful. Um, you know, that our story is, connect us to what we're trying to do yeah because i know that for me when when i went as i touched on last week when i went through you know some of my experiences and i went through um my sort of cbt therapy mm. it was around my values and that connection to what i'm actually doing and how i'm spending my life and putting yeah. my time and effort into and that, what that means to me and i found you know i was doing things that just I wasn't connected to in that way yeah. and so that's why what i do now is so powerful because i'm so directly connected to it it Absolutely. comes from my own experiences and i, I, yeah. I think it's the same as can be said for you so it, it is it's it's and honestly like i mean there's so much more I, I i could say with stuff that i've experienced like this stuff that i've experienced since being in business has been horrific but also so good yeah, you know, said so I, I started again, I started the business again, I'd say October the 26th, 2008, £2.87 in my bank, 
done a joint venture, made over six grand, kickstarted the business again. Brilliant. 2009, <clears throat> between February and December of 2009, we had seven family funerals. I lost all of my grandparents. <clears throat> so first of all, it started off with a lady who lives opposite my mum and dad. So I'd grown up. She was like another mum uh, figure to me. She was beautiful, beautiful lady. Eileen, bless herself. Um, my mum and dad were away in India. She passed away in February. Then I think it was in April. Uh, one of my nans passed away. <clears throat> and then I think it was a couple of months after that. Um, like my actual granddads I lost before I was born, but I call these two granddads because they were all I, all I met. But then, then one of my granddads um, passed away. Then my other nan passed away. Then my other granddad passed away. Then I think it was my mum's auntie or cousin, something like that. So yeah, between February and December of 2009, we had seven family funerals. I'd split up then with, like say, my ex. I was up north on my own, starting this business, pretending everything was okay. Life was great. Parents would ring me up. How are you getting on? Yeah, great. I love it. You know, life's great. <clears throat> Living in this tiny, tiny little studio apartment, um, barely any money. I was sleeping on a, on a leather bed, which was freezing. <clears throat> there was no proper central heating in this apartment. It was freezing. <clears throat> Most nights I was going to bed with like four layers on and like blankets and everything on this sofa. And I would literally just lay there all night, wrapped up like a cocoon, not wanting to move. And I'd done that, I think, for about 18 months uh, in this little apartment. And um, but I, and I can remember one day my dad rang me up and uh, he was like, hello, mate, you all right? And I, I I always called him Pops, bless him. I was like, hey, Pops, you all right? And he was like, yeah, good, you? And I went, yeah, good, thanks. He went, oh, cool. He went, and everything's all right? I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you, you just asked me that about three times. I was like, I'm, I'm fine. He went, oh, okay, cool. And started chatting away again a bit. And um, and he was like, he said, can you remember uh, a guy called uh, Clive I used to work with? I went, yeah, of course I can, yeah. He went, can you remember what happened to his son? I went, yeah, of course, sadly. I said, yes, he took his own life. He went, that's correct. He went, are you all right? And I went, what? He went, are you okay? And um, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, I'm okay. He went, you sure? He went, do you want to come home? And I went, I'm fine. I said, I've got my life up here now. He went, okay, so do you know we're always here? Because we're such a close family. He said, you know we're always here for you, yeah? And I went, oh, no, of course. I said, we've been so daft for. I said, I'm all right. He went, okay, just as long as you are. And I remember I put the phone down and boy, did I like, I just broke down, broke down. And I was like, shit, parents know everything. They ain't daft. They know everything. I was 300 miles away. They weren't stupid. <clears throat> but I found myself, despite everything that I'd been through growing up, I suddenly found myself in the deepest, 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 darkest place that I'd ever, ever been in in my life. It was horrific. <clears throat> Most days, I wouldn't get out of bed. I went months where I barely opened my front door. Um, I would order takeaways. Um, if I did have to go to the shop, I would. But I was living the laptop lifestyle, working online. So when I did have a meeting or a call, just splash my face, put a top on, do the call, finish that, get back into bed and literally just cover myself up. I didn't want to know the world. It was horrific. And I can remember, like I said, the, the, the webinar that taught me about digital products and joint ventures, which uh, led me to relaunching the business, the same guy was running another webinar and it was about making money on social media this was 2000 and yeah 2000 early 2010 well, i had nothing else to do so i was like i might as well listen to this so i went on it and i was making money social media back there was so much different to what it was now and i was making some pretty good money and uh, the first question he said on this webinar is i you know comment yes if anyone's making money on facebook so i was like yes 
And there was only a few of us. It was God knows how many of us on there, but there's only a few of us. And I, I was one of the first to say, he was like, Paul, he said, how much money are you making on Facebook? I said, well, I said, I just made $8,000 last week. And he went, he, well, he went, and how long did that take you to make that? I went, last week, like literally like a couple of days. And he was like, what? So then others were like, yeah, I've made like a few hundred quid and this, that and everything else. And, and he'd done his presentation and he was like, has anyone else made any more money? And I was like, well, yeah, I said like a few days ago, like I said, I made like another like $1,400. Dollars, uh, was it forty? I think it's about fourteen hundred dollars, something like that. About thirteen hundred pound, twelve hundred pound, something like that. <clears throat> so obviously, I kept popping up. So we done the webinar, and at the end of it, um, it was like, look, thanks for you guys who you know been answering the questions and stuff, been really interactive. He's like, Paul, I'm going to reach out to you um, on Facebook. Well, this dude was a multi millionaire, and I'm like, what? I was like, shit. I was like, this was like, again, probably the second webinar in my life I'd ever been on. I was like, oh no, now what have I done? Who have I upset now? You know what I mean? <laughs> There's something like this dude sent me a friend request on Facebook and sent me a message. He was like, mate, he said, um, I'm really fascinated in what you were saying on there. He said, and you're making this money. I'd love to speak to you. So we arranged this call. He was in Cyprus. We arranged this call via Skype at the time. And again, I'd only been introduced to Skype in 2008 when I'd done my first uh, product launch. <clears throat> so again, all this sort of online world is new to me. So we had a bit of a chat and he asked me what I was doing and, and I told him and he was like, I'd love to interview you. And I went, what do you mean interview me? I went, why do you want to interview me? I was like, you're like a million, multi-millionaire. I went, shouldn't I be interviewing you? He went, no, it's not how it works. And I went, okay, I don't really know what you're on about. I went, but yeah, cool. <clears throat> so anyway, he interviewed me. And told him about how I was making money online and stuff. And he was like, boy, he's like, this is amazing. And then a few months after that, he then come back and he was like, look, he said, uh, I'm putting an event on in London called the Ultimate Facebook Seminar. He said, I'd love, for you, love you to come and speak on stage and share your story in that. And I went, oh, yeah, all right, cool. I said, yeah, I said, well, I do that. You know, I said, I'm used to speaking to you know, 20, 30 people at events and stuff. And he went, oh, he went, no, no, he said, there's probably going to be like 2,000 people. And I went, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, no worries. He went, great, you'll do it. I went, what? He went, you'll do it. And I went, no. I went, fuck that. And he was like, what do you mean, no? I went, okay. I was like, look, I said, I need to be honest with you, Mark. I said, literally for the last year, I said, I've barely been outside. I said, I've been fighting huge depression. I've had these seven family funerals. I said, I'm in a right mess. Um, I said, no. He went, wow. He said, well, you didn't come across like that when I interviewed you. And I was like, well, because I was distracted and I was talking to you about other things. I said, and that's what I needed. He went, so you need a distraction in your life. I went, yeah. He went, brilliant. He said, I'll put your name down. You can come and speak. And I went, oh, man. I went, you sure you don't mean 200? He went, no. Nope. He said, it'll be 2,000. I was like, damn. So anyway, obviously he announced that I was speaking. And his database then, his email list was at the time then about 150,000 people. So he was marketing me out to all these hundreds of thousands of people about me making money online, what I was doing. And literally, mate, overnight, I suddenly become like this flipping online success dude. It was ridiculous. Well, I'd only made like probably 10 grand in, you know, whatever. It wasn't a huge amount, but everyone loved what I was doing because obviously I'd gone from like, you know, sharing my story and everything else. And um, so then when I went to this event, I did go, I went down and do it. And I walked into this event and I was like, holy shit. It's, this is ridiculous but as i walked in people were like oh my god it's paul 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 and i was like yeah man i was like i'm loving this like this is it was like i feel like david beckham or whatever you know what i mean i'm like i'm loving it i was in the element and suddenly again it was like i found my purpose you know it's like i can remember when i was 19 i first spoke to people at a college so i'd been kind of speaking on and off like my life but not really thinking anything about it suddenly now like this was it like there was two thousand people here and that was it again it's just kind of catapulted me he then uh, contacted me after the event he's like look i'm writing a book called the laptop millionaire he's like i'd love to feature in it and some of my mates are in it which is uh where is it? so the laptop millionaire um how anyone can escape the nine to five and make money online uh, includes 32 proven ways to make money online. So I was, you know, I was in there. And then suddenly, yeah, it just, it all went. But then I then start chasing the money. Um, my first PDF book, um, 
that then got turned into a book. I'd off, I was offered a publishing contract. God knows where that is. So that, uh, that become a book, uh, which was unbelievable. So suddenly I was having like lots of success and I started getting more hate online, more hate online. I was getting death threats. I was getting all sorts and pushed me back again. Um, so it's been it's been a massive, massive roller coaster my, my whole life. Ups and downs, ups and downs. I was getting loads of media. I was on radio stations and everything. Else. And then the more success that was coming in, um, the more hate I started getting. And again, it affected me. So then, you know, I've said to you before, I then stopped posting online. I stopped putting stuff out there um and i let them win i let them win i let them get the better of me um and then to a point i was just like no i'm not gonna let them win and i carried on and i've wrote other books as people know um but then again covid covid hit stopped me doing any live events so again that was the other sucker punch um suddenly my whole business stopped i was doing no training no live events and as people know, obviously me and the now ex, we split up. We were due to get married. We split up. So my whole life has been huge ups and then massive downs. And I swear, and it's, you know, I'm just not because I'm trying to sell from this, but if it wasn't for my daily habits, my daily rituals of what I've said, like routine, simplicity, exercise, journaling, meditations, affirmation, if it wasn't for them, I really don't think I'd be here because they have kept me one mentally strong. They've kept me grounded. And obviously my parents and my family have. Um, but if it wasn't for the habits, the daily habits that I've created for myself and done for the last 20 years, I really don't think I'd be. I think I'd be either 12 foot under or I would have been in a nut house. Not a nut house. That's horrible. I've mental home, whatever, whatever you call it. Sorry, that doesn't offend anybody. That's the wrong thing to say. But you know what I mean? Um, I would have been in a completely different place if it wasn't for habits. I changed my daily habits, which have helped with my anxiety. I hate the word mental health. And I'm going to start calling it like mind health or something like that. Um, but it really has helped me with that. I changed my habits. I changed my lifestyle. Yes, I still have my days. Yes, I still have my moments. I'm only human. But I know I've learned how to a live with them and I've learned how to overcome them. But most importantly, I recognize when I'm in that situation, when I find myself in that situation of circumstances that are, that are bad, I know what to do. And like you were saying, that's why I coach people, because my story has led me to learn ways of dealing with it, overcoming with it, living with it. But most importantly, I recognize those moments. And again, I said to you and the other guys a few weeks ago, I had a moment a few weeks ago where, you know, I just kind of out of frustration, just blasted stuff on Facebook, bang, bang, bang. And I was like, what am I doing? You know, I deleted those posts. I'm nothing bad, but I deleted those posts. And I was like, that's it. I'm in one of those situations. I need to move away. And I recognize it now. And I think for me, that's my core strength is that I recognize these things um and again that's why i do what i do with my clients because i recognize it within them i create the plan for them we work through these daily habits these daily rituals and i use the 2190 rule to help them do it which is very simply the case of when you start a new habit um do it habit or hobby but we're talking about habits start a new habit do it for 21 days consistently for 21 days and then do it for 90 days. So within 21 days, doing something consistently every day for 21 days creates a new habit into your life. When you do it every day for 90 days, it is proven, scientifically proven, that it becomes a new lifestyle. So whatever you do, use the 2190 rule to overcome the stuff that you're going through. Um but yeah, it's it's been like I say, you know, I like to think that I'm halfway through my life. I like to think the next 40 years, please, <laughs> please <laughs> someone make it a little bit easier. because uh, I swear like these gray hairs are uh, you know, it's come from a lot of ups and downs, a lot of stresses and stuff. But you know, it's life. We all go through it. The difference is learning, accepting, understanding on, on how to deal with it. So so yeah, that's uh that's it really, mate. It's been been one hell of a journey. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's it's really powerful to hear you talk about those sort of six daily habits that you do and how they've helped you. And I think, you know, coming from from my experience of being quite new into the, the wellness industry, I think what would be really interesting further down the line of this podcast would be to have a, a bit more of a discussion around what those things actually do for you yeah. what affirmations actually do you know because yeah, for, yeah. for people it, it can be really different and and obviously they have different affirmations around what's important to them and, yeah. and how journaling can be really important and and i know that you're um you know you've done a lot of work around meditation and you, you're, you're a meditation teacher as well and i think mm. sharing some of that because it's very easy to go online and just hear oh yeah meditation so amazing it's so powerful mm. Have you tried journaling? And it's like yeah. if you're somebody who's going through serious anxiety and depression, and you're like, okay, I'll, I'll journal, I guess, exactly. but I don't really know what I'm doing like, today. Yeah. I ate for breakfast. This, and yeah, this. exactly. Yeah, you, you don't yeah. really know in yeah. what format these things work. Yeah, but you understand that they have power and that they can really, exactly. you know, help and assist you on on a journey from moving away from you know yeah. those negative mental health issues that, that we've discussed so absolutely you know i think it will be really interesting i know one of the things that we t- wanted to talk about probably, journal uh, journal i'm surrounded like affirmations and daily journaling like yeah love it love it and I, as, as i was saying i think one of the things that we'd sort of suggest that we would talk about in one of our episodes was around you know the terminology which you just touched on there around mental health and that was a conversation we had before we even started doing the podcast yeah. together around you know trying to find better language to use that wasn't so inflammatory for certain yeah. people and didn't you know trigger certain thoughts in in people as well yeah. but i also think around that terminology of of journaling and affirmations and meditation and because mm. i know there's a lot of different types of meditations and yeah. you can meditate for different reasons and i exactly. think that if people get an insight into actually how that can help them and what type of way it's going to help them yeah you know because ultimately i think that's what we both want to do here we want to help yeah. people so. absolutely yeah i'd love that i'd love that absolutely because it is it's you know, the meditation I do is mindfulness meditation, but there is, there's so much, but yeah, that'd be great. We'll do sort of, you know, do different episodes on, on each one and, and discuss it in more detail and break it down on how yeah. or why it's helped me. That would be amazing. Absolutely. Well, I, I just want to say personally, thank you for for sharing your story and, and, you know, obviously, you know, I recognized it wasn't easy for you to talk about some of those things. So I really appreciate you sharing that with me and and with the listeners and yeah you know to have gone through so much trauma um certainly around bereavement you know it's it's a credit that you are where you are and I think you know perhaps it's also been the making of you it's helped to develop resilience and and that kind of I hate to coin a a really bad football term but that bounce back ability (laughs) I, I I think it is like I think it's I think it's kind of that that sportsman in me um you know always wanting to win but also having amazing parents and support around me uh, my mum always saying to me never give up and I even had this conversation with her last night and I text her when I got home I was with her last night and we had a conversation and um when I got home she's like we was talking about this program that I've created for the kids and she's like just keep doing what you're doing and I text her back saying mum you've told me all my life never to give up I said I'm not giving up now I said this is just the start and that is what I will finish this on because I know you've got to go, mate, and I will finish it on there. But whatever you're doing in life, wherever you are in life, please, please just make one promise to yourself. And that is that you will never, ever give up. You will never give up. I know I'm on this planet to make a difference. Um, and I'm I'm doing it one person at a day. I'm doing it. And I can remember when I got my very first mentor and I've got it in my book and I don't need to read it. But I put it in here and he said, he said these words to me. I just want to try and find a picture if I can. I'd love to, I don't know where it is. Um, it's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So it's a little picture there and I'll leave it on here. This is in my first book. But um, he said these words and anyone who's connected with me on WhatsApp, I've actually put them on my, uh, on my WhatsApp thing. And I'll leave it on this. <clears throat> The life you have led until now 
doesn't have to be the only life you lead. And he said them to me as my first ever mentor in 2010 when I told him about my story and his shit I've been through. He went, so you've been through all of that. He said, that doesn't mean that has to be the rest of your life. We are in control of our life every single day. We control what we do, where we go, how we do it, what our habits are, what our choices are. If you're not happy with your life, it's down to you. It's your decisions. It's your habits. You truly can, and I honestly believe this, you truly can have the life that you deserve to live if you make the right decisions. There's a reason why my business is called Peace With Paul, because everything that I do is to help people have success in all areas of their life. So they too, you lot included, whoever listens to this, can live a life of peace and happiness, because that's what we all deserve. We all deserve to live a life of peace and happiness. So look, thank you to everyone or anyone who listens to this. Tom, thank you so much. I know you've got to go, mate. Thank you for your time. Thank you for asking these questions. Thank you for allowing me to speak and share this with, with whoever listens. Um, I know my story has been very well documented, but there's, I know there's a lot been said there that a lot of people won't know. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'll let you go. And yeah, to everyone else, please just do whatever you've got to do, but please live a life of peace of happiness. So important. And I just pray that, you know, whoever listens to this, take something out of it. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Take care. See you in the next episode.